Okay, so we want to carry on talking about resource allocations and really in this case we're, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of adjusting the schedule to accommodate, you know, scarce or overconstrained resources or otherwise just seeking, uh, you know, efficiencies. And uh, so let's look at, we, we tend to break it down into two categories and I haven't always done that, but uh, it seems to be the way of things these days. So I'm going to go with it. And so we talk about resource leveling and constrained or over-constrained resources. Uh, so when it comes to resource leveling, it appears to be that the want to, so I've used the term resource leveling to, to both of these uh, in the past, but nowadays it seems to be that the resource leveling is constrained to seeking efficiencies. So where we want to basically level out the hills and valleys of resource demand so that you can have a more steady uh, resource requirement. So if we put that into human terms, you know, so, you know, say you have a, a pool of four computer programmers working on coding and you have peri periods of really high peak demand and periods of little demand. I mean, it can be a real imposition and challenge when it comes to scheduling. Uh, and, and costing of those resources because you've got periods where they're underutilized and periods where they're overutilized. And, you know, on, in the simplest model, you've got periods of high overtime, which is very expensive, and periods of non-effective use where they're underutilized. And so that's what resource leveling is all about, is to try to level out those uh, dips and valleys. Um, the, the, the constrained resources or over-constrained resources basically is about trying to adjust the schedule so that we're within the available resources. Uh, so if you have, say, one crane, but you have two parallel activities that are each need a crane, obviously they can't happen at the same time, you know, that type of thing. Now, the manner in which we do it tends to be the same. Uh, however, you know, you obviously need to take care of the over-constrained resources first to make sure that what you have is a schedule that's achievable, and then you move on to start looking at efficiencies and everything else. And you, you wouldn't necessarily choose to do, like, for example, you wouldn't necessarily choose to extend the timeline in order to manage an efficiency, but you would have to do that if necessary to manage a over-constrained resource. So that's really where we're at it. I mean, uh, uh, as you can see there, you know, certainly select critical assets are gonna have a very specific schedule. They're gonna be highly sought after. You're gonna have to manage that schedule. Again, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, there's interdependencies, not just within your project, but with other projects going on in your organization. So integrating with those resource schedules and resource calendars become really important. And fortunately, you know, some of the, the software that we're using these days to do this sort of thing are able to manage a corporate resource calendar and allow that integration of multiple projects looking at the same resource calendars. So if we talk about resource leveling, which is really about trying to make things efficient and either of these, like I say, they, they look very similar when you do them. So, so I've always likened both of them as a, a game of Tetris as we try to stack the resources efficiently within a flat um, uh, pile of, of bricks. And uh, you, you'll see as we look at some of the examples why I think of this as this game of Tetris. Um, so if you can level the resources, you know, there's a number of things that you gain. You have less hands-on management because everybody's gainfully employed day to day and you're not moving people from task and project to project and task to task, losing efficiencies and startup time and all those things. And so it becomes a, a simpler, more effective uh, environment within which your resources are being are working. Um, you know, they, they suggest you might be able to use just in time delivery in the inventory because it's steady state. Uh, that may be true. I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we start uh, to when, when we do the uh, summary conversation about some of the challenges and, and why just in time delivery for inventory is 
very effective when it comes to you know line operations and routine operations but uh, less effective when it comes to projects so so keep that one in mind i'm not convinced that it's one you want to be chasing down uh yeah it improves morale obviously nobody likes to have a lot of slack time and then periods of absolutely crazy uh, out of the world demand uh, which reduces personnel problems and it just manages better if it, it's more effective so, so the, you know, the one thing that they note is that within the slack, so your non-critical activities now give you a degree of flexibility. That's the way we described it. And so you're able to move those non-critical activities to accommodate um, resource leveling and to try to make it more efficient. Uh, now, you want to be careful. You don't want to use up all of your slack because your slack in some ways is also some of your safety time, right? Your, your uh, time reserve is built into that you you slide it to the right to make up for resources and then something doesn't work out perfectly and now you're late and so you've added to the critical path so uh yeah we're we absolutely when we look at this we're largely only going to be moving non-critical uh, resources uh, or sorry, non-critical activities in order to level out our resources for efficiency reasons, uh, because it, normally we're not willing to suffer an extension to the timeline just for slightly more efficient uh, resource leveling. Certainly when it comes to over-constrained resources, that's a different story. So if we look at resource leveling uh you know so we can typically do that by hand for small projects or we can do it uh, by branch or subtask and everything else uh, when you get to the really large complex projects you, you know it is really hard to do uh, by hand and you can use computer programs i i sometimes can get frustrated with computer programs they seem to have a mind of their own Al although you're you can set the rules by which they will resource level and seek optimization um, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've found it challenging uh, to do it by hand and, and be happy with the results. But anyway, so, so what does it look like? So if we have a Gantt chart on the right, and one of my favorite views in Microsoft Project is where I put my Gantt chart on a split screen above my resource graphs uh, below it. So what does a resource graph look like? So if I were to build this one up, it basically piles up your quantum uh, of the resource that's being graphed uh, and represents it based on the activities and when they're scheduled. So in this case, I would have labor dedicated to activity C. Uh, you know, half that labor, two laborers dedicated to activity B and another two act uh, laborers dedicated to activity A. And so the way it is scheduled right now, we see you know, C takes up four laborers. That's on the critical path. There's no slack there to move it around. We have two laborers dedicated to activity B, which runs two thirds of the time. And one third of the time, uh, we have two laborers dedicated to activity A. Now, this isn't a particularly level path because we have this peak demand in the first third of the period. And, and then it's ever decreasing as we go through the period. And so it, may it certainly is possible when you look at it to work within the slack and move activity a to the right schedule it all the way to the right and you will see how its resources fall in uh, to that pile of tetris blocks and levels this out and in this case because it's an example and we've arranged it that way we have a perfectly level resource demand and we've done it all within the slack of the non-critical activities normally it wouldn't be quite so easy and that's why we say large projects not possible to to do by hand now if i were to identify that we only had um, six laborers available then clearly that would have been a, an issue of being an over constrained resource because we wouldn't have been able to schedule it in the manner that we had originally. But that wasn't the premise that we set off on. It was simply one of seeking efficiencies. So let's carry on with our game of Tetris, if you will. So here, once again, we have our Gantt chart. We have three activities identified on the critical path and activity B uh, showing some slack. 
and we're going to list all of our resources that we need to do that. And so quite typically we would identify a series of resource graphs, again, displayed underneath it. And in the way I normally have Microsoft Projects shown up, the, the dotted line indicates the actual resources available for assignment uh, in this based on the resource calendars. And so if we pile up the blocks or the demand based on where the CPM and PERT have scheduled all of our activities, we see that we are actually over constrained. We have a, a demand early on of too many laborers and too many carpenters based on the activities and their requirements. And so now what we need to do is we need to slide activities around in order to fit them in, much like we did on the last slide. The, the difference here is that they are over constrained. And so whereas when all we're doing is seeking efficiencies, we wouldn't normally consider moving critical path activities or anything else, but we don't have any choice here. Uh, we have to find a plan that will allow us to execute this with the resources available. And that might include extending the uh, project, which would be mean moving critical path activities. And so we would try to do it within the slack of the non-critical activities, but then if necessary, we would do some combination thereof. Now, alternatively, you might consider uh, changing the method or the resources you might need for a particular activity in order to relieve a problem that you're not able to uh, find a solution for it. But we, you know, we can talk about that a little bit later. So in this case, as we set up uh, to do that, I'm actually recognizing that it's not uh, achievable just by moving activity B. I've already taken my slider and I've moved it back and forth and I was not able to, to resolve some of the resource challenges. If I move over activity D, although that's extending my project, I can see that that takes care of most of my resource issues. And then simply by moving activity B uh, to its latest finish, I'm able to resolve the rest of my resources. So they're not quite level, uh, but they are all achievable within the constraints of the resource calendars. So, you know, when we talk about those efficiencies, the resource leveling for efficiency purposes, um, you know, we do see that that demand uh, fluctuates based on when the activities are scheduled and we, we do want to make it as level as we can. And so some of the methods we can use to do that are to level the demand by moving those activities and, and typically in this case only moving the non-critical uh, activities. Uh, but we also can consider altering the um, uh, resources available? Do we hire more people? Do we get more equipment? Do we look at rentals instead of in-house machinery? Do we go to contract instead of doing it by in-house? And so there are another whole raft of tools that we can consider on the demand side when we redefine how a specific activity might be achieved. Now, the, the one thing the, that the textbook talks about, which I think is something you, you should keep in mind, I mean, we talked about overhead early on in budgets and everything else. Um, you need to keep, so, some of those critical resources are absolutely essential and they're not going to work at 100% efficiency and capacity all of the time. And, and so for those resources that are truly scarce, that you probably should only be scheduling them at 85 to 90% capacity because of the stochastic uh, uh, nature of the project, not every activity time is gonna be met. Those resources are gonna to have to continue to function until those projects are met and other ones are starting. And so if everything is scheduled at 100%, your yeah, I mean, it's pretty much a 0% likelihood that you're actually going to achieve that. So when it comes to constrained resource scheduling, we typically have a couple different approaches. And we talk about these really for those large, massive, giant projects that we, we just, you know, have a really, really hard time doing it. And so there's two approaches. There's the heuristic approach, which is basically to follow a series of rules of thumb in order to optimize your project. Uh, or there's an optimization approach, which is really to let the computer uh, go through a series of optimization routines to try to find the one best solution. And of course, you can define the rules within which that optimization uh, is achieved. 
So let, we'll look at uh, the heuristic approaches. Uh, they're probably the ones that most people work with. Uh, you know, I certainly have done the optimization routines with the computer. Rarely been really happy with it. Sometimes I've, I've accepted it and then modified it manually after the fact. Um, but anyway, the heuristic methods, uh, they're largely the only feasible methods on really large nonlinear complex projects. And I would tend to agree with that. Um, now, they talk about it not being optimal. Uh, you know, the other one's optimal because they go through a, an algorithm in order to come up with the one best solution. To be fair, that's within a tolerance. So it just means that the tolerance is tighter than the uh, tolerance that you're going to get with a heuristic method. But that being said, the, the heuristic method probably recognizes the realities of some of the stop start issues and everything else as you go through it uh, and will get you to a very good solution uh, whereas the optimization routines often can break down some of those uh, issues and try to impose a schedule which is just not achievable and will have other secondary consequences. So the nice thing is is that your commercial software does allow for a lot of flexibility when it comes to trying your hur heuristic uh, approaches and you can come up with multiple options and variants and then figure out which one is going to work best for your for your project and uh, you know it really is that game of tetris when i was saying you know you just basically pick up the activity and you slide it to the right while looking at the resource graph and you are able to play uh you know this computer game to try to uh, level out your resources so as we saw, we're, we're basically taking our CPM PERT uh, results as our starting point. We've overlaid our resource calendars and our resource requirements because the resource requirements were loaded into our work breakdown structure. So now they're in our CPM and our PERT and the resource calendars are available through the organization or into the software itself. And now we're able to overlay them and now our job uh, kicks in. So that's our starting point. So there are a number of uh, heuristic rules of thumb that we can apply. Some work better than others. Uh, and you can go through, apply one, go through, apply the next one, then apply the next one and figure out what's going to work for you. So some of the rules that they, they talk about, you know, as soon as possible. So as soon as possible, first off, that's what it, the CPM will generate. It, everything is as soon as possible. And, and so that's kind of our starting point. Uh, and then you can also look to, as a heuristic rule, as late as possible. Now, the benefit to going as late as possible is, of course, we're delaying our cash flow requirements because now all of the resource demands and all of the cash demands and everything else are going to arrive in the timeline as late as possible. Obviously, the trade-off with that is that you don't have any response time left. You've traded it all away. Pretty much, if you start everything as late as possible, you're putting everything on its critical path within its timeline. So shortest task first, uh, basically that would maximize the number of tasks that are completed. So depending on the value of the task as an item versus the quantum of the material that is delivered in the task, uh, that may or may not be of value to you. Uh, most resources first. Uh, the implication there is that normally where something has a lot of resources implicated in it, that it is the most important. Uh, and thus we're able to prioritize importance. Uh, by choosing quantum of resources. Uh, one of the ones that uh, I like the most is minimum slack first. Uh, and so that obviously gives priority to your critical path. And then outside of the critical path, you start looking at uh, those non-critical activities that have the least breathing room. So take those first and those that have the greatest breathing room, we allow them to, to uh, slide a little bit right and hopefully get done still within their, uh, their slack. And, and this one seems to have a, a fairly great following. I think the logic for it is fairly obvious. Um, so, so the other thing I would point out is when we talk about slack, of course, we've been looking at single activity slack, but you have to actually look at the total slack within the branch because there are uh, interdependencies. We saw that where one activity shifted right, uh, 
the other activity shifted with it. And so they were losing their slack, even as one activity ahead of it was losing its slack. So total slack within the branch becomes an important concept to consider. Um, most critical followers. So depending on, you know, uh, so you're on a branch, which is not on the critical path, but if it branches back onto the critical path, now we want to look at, okay, what are the greatest like, or the greatest number of critical activities that follow it and are dependent on it. Uh, so we don't want to put them at risk by delaying those particular activities. And, and then we talk about most successors. It's the same idea, only we're not dif differentiating between critical activities and non-critical activities and arbitrary as anything else we can think of. So just some rules of thumb that you can use when doing the leveling and trying to map the efficiencies of your schedule. So, you know, those are the common ones. You, you can come up with any ones that uh, seem to make sense for your organization or for your situation. Uh, and depending on which one you're doing, you're, you can either start at the beginning or start at the end and work uh, towards the other side. So it's uh, fairly flexible from that perspective. Um, you know, now just keep that in mind, comparing it to the optimization methods, which they say will find the one best solution within the tolerances of the algorithm that it is generating it. Um, it often uses linear programming uh, to achieve that, which may or may not be reflective of what's actually going on in your project. And, and you know, it says not all projects can be optimized. Typically what I found is that I could always arrive at an optimized outcome and that's in my case i'm not disagreeing with what they say but in my case i've always been able to come up with an optimized uh, schedule but i haven't necessarily been happy with what the optimized schedule looked like i, I thought that the secondary or tertiary um, impacts of the optimization routine outweighed some of the benefits of the the primary benefits that it was seeking in its optimization routine and so then i would either throw it out and start from scratch do it manually or i would use it and try to work backwards to undo some of those secondary or tertiary uh, impacts and, and so that's really the mechanics uh, of resource leveling uh, it, it is simple in its concept and incredibly complicated in its implementation uh, you know, until you actually sit down with a rather complex project and you try to, you know, make make the over constrained resources uh, be you know work within the schedule. Uh, sometimes that's all you can ever hope for, and then the optimizations or the uh, resource leveling for for efficiency purposes, you just let that go. Uh, it is incredibly complicated to actually put into effect. It is incredibly simple in its concept. And so I will leave resource leveling with that. Uh, we will come back and talk about some of the overall human impacts and everything else dealing with schedule and resources, uh, but we'll do that in a separate sort of wrap up video uh, when this is done. So uh, hopefully that was uh, a value and you've got a feel for what it all looks like. Uh, and certainly without computers, this would be a heck of a lot more difficult to do. Now, with our resources leveled, at least we actually have a schedule that we think we could achieve if it wasn't for all of the risks that we had built into it.